you'll have to sing on this song if you don't want to. If you like the idea, though, you can help me out. If you love your Uncle Sam, bring him home. Bring him home. Support our boys in Vietnam. Bring him home. Bring him home. It'll make our general sad, I know. Bring him home. Bring him home. They want to tangle with the bow. Bring him home. Bring him home. Here is their big fallacy. Bring them home, bring them home. They don't have the right weaponry. Bring them home, bring them home. The world's got hunger and ignorance. Bring them home, bring them home. You can't beat that with bombs and guns. Bring them home, bring them home. So if you love your uncles. Sing this song, bring a song, bring a song. Now there's one thing I will confess, bring a song, bring a song. I'm not really a pacifist, bring a song, bring a song. If an army invaded this land of mine, bring a song, you'd find me out on the firing line, bring a song. Even if they drop their queens to bomb, bring them home, bring them home. Oh, they brought helicopters and a bomb, bring them home, bring them home. Oh, if you love your Uncle Sam, support our boys in Vietnam, bring them home, bring them home. Yes, show these generals their fallacy. Bring them home, bring them home. The world needs housing, food, and schools. Bring them home, home, home. And when they have few universal rules, bring them home, bring them home. So if you love your uncle Sam, support our boys in Vietnam. Bring them home, bring them home. Sing on this now, if I can stop that, <laughs> I thought I had stopped it. Okay. So, uh, welcome to what is probably the 30th Zoom in the series that the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee has created. And I am going to turn this over now to Terry Province, who is going to be the moderator for this program. Terry. John, thank you very much. And also on behalf of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee, I'd like to welcome you to our program featuring international opposition to the U.S. war in Indochina. My name is Terry and I'm here in Washington, D.C. And to those of you in Australia and the Far East, we say good morning. You're probably having breakfast. To those of you in Europe, we're hoping that you're sleeping because you know this is recorded. As you've done before, you'll be able to see it unless you're staying up late and having a nightcap. Uh, for those of you on the East Coast of the United States, it's a uh, good evening and we're just finishing dessert. And for those on the West Coast of the United States, it's afternoon and you're about to have dinner. Global movements for peace and justice, fortunately, is something that we have been able to recognize more recently, perhaps because it's easier to do with constant 24-hour news and social media. For example, right now, opposition to the Israeli genocide in Gaza, there are people all over the world demonstrating for a ceasefire and an end to that conflict. Not too long ago, but still active is the worldwide global decarbonization environmental movement which has joined everywhere in the world, fortunately. 
Before that, there was a lot of international activity against apartheid in South Africa. And before that, amazingly so, because of its danger, was an international anti-nuclear weapons, anti-nuclear energy movement. And before that was opposition to Vietnam. And before that, there was the initial anti-nuclear movement when one country dropped nuclear weapons on Japan, other countries, now nine, have them. And these are the actions after World War II. So Vietnam, in some way, was just more substantial and in many countries was kind of a unique experience for a lot of those people around the world in terms of peace and justice. And tonight is our first program on the global movement featuring Australia, South Korea, and Japan. We will do another webinar in which we lift up the activities in Europe and Canada. Tonight, we have two people who will talk about one country and one person who will talk about two countries. And you have the, autobi the biographies and the bios in your program, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail except to say that Rowan Cow, who is near Sydney, Australia right now, was a conscientious objector, a writer, an organizer, has several books. You're gonna learn much more about him and the other two people from what they say tonight, but I invite you to go to the bio section in the registration that you have undertaken. Bobby Oliver is also in Australia, in Perth. She's a professor and an author and has done a lot of work on Australian labor, which she'll talk about in her presentation. After the two of them are finished in about 25 minutes, Tim Shurrock, who actually grew up in Japan and South Korea, is about four blocks away from me in Washington, DC. He has done a lot of anti-nuclear, anti-war activity all his life, is still doing. And in case you think, though he grew up there, he may not be as familiar, just last year he was in Japan and South Korea. So it's my pleasure to welcome all of you. I wanna give a special shout out to Mark Pavlik for having made the arrangements for this. So we'll hear from Rowan, then Bobby, and then Tim. And that'll take about 40, 45 minutes. And then we will have a little discussion among the panelists. And you can send in Q and A's as this is happening. In the last half hour, we're expected to go for 90 minutes. The last half hour will hopefully be your questions as well as other questions spark from the intermingle of the presentation. So if there are no other questions or comments, then it's Jerry, let, to... let me sure say not. one housekeeping thing. Yep. The chat is closed at this point. Um, it will open when we go to the discussion section of the program. If you have questions, put them on the Q&A, but only questions. It makes it very hard for the moderator to sort things out if it's mixed up with comments. Hold your comments until we open the chat, which will be when we get to the discussion. John, I really appreciate that. Thank you. So Rowan, it's so good to see you. Good morning in uh, nearby Sydney, and we'd love to hear a lot more, please. Uh, well, greetings and hello, people. Uh, to begin, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am today, the Gandangara people and I pay respect to their elders, past and present. Uh, in 1962, the conservative and rapidly anti-communist Australian government of Prime Minister Menzies sent 30 military advisers to join the South Vietnam and the US war effort in Vietnam. In 1964, this was Substantially increased the combat troops during the course of Australia's participation in the war, which ended in 1972 for us. Some 60,000 Australians served, of whom 523 died as a result, and 2,400 were wounded. And amongst those who served and those who died and were wounded were 16,000 conscripts. Australia has never felt at home in Asia and through much of the 20th century tried to maintain itself as a, a white racial society. It's a settler colonial state created via Britain's invasion beginning in 1788 with war and dispossession of the first peoples. It's an island continent, a bit smaller in size than the US minus Alaska and Hawaii, sparsely populated, 53% of it is desert, or practically so, 
It's got a population today of 27 million. Back in the 60s, it was 11 million. Federated and uh, as a nation since 1901, it's traditionally looked for a powerful friend and ally to come to its aid in what is a perpetually feared invasion. Its experiences with Japan during World War II, which saw Japanese air and uh, naval attacks on Australian soil and in Australian waters, heightened this fear. Until the fall of Singapore and the end of British power in Asia in 1942, and post-war followed by the exit of India from the British Empire, the, the mother country, as it was called, provided this security, real or imagined. Subsequently, based on a close military and strategic relationship forged during World War II with the, uh, the US, successive Australian governments have attached their nation, or this nation, to the military and strategic interests of the US. In November 1964, the Australian government introduced conscription. The Australian Army wasn't sizable enough to do the job ahead in Vietnam and recruitment drives weren't bringing the sort of uh, quality of manpower needed. So a, a selective scheme was uh, concocted involving all males as they turned 20 years of age a year before they got the right to vote. To avoid compromising the economy and stuffing up the workforce, it was designed to only select one in 12 males and letting the rest get on with their lives. The odds of being selected were one in 12. These lengthened to in the 70s to one in 17. All up from the introduction of the uh, conscription until 1972, Nearly 64,000 males were conscripted out of a pool of 804,000. Conscription involved two years continuous full-time military service, followed by another three and a half in the reserve. Selection was made through a lottery barrel and lottery balls, and a certain number of balls were drawn out, and those balls represented uh, birth dates. It happened twice a year, the year divided in two lots of birthday dates. So the scheme created two classes of conscripts. Males already in the workforce were conscripted, who were conscripted, went straight into the army. Males who were conscripted whilst doing their university studies, like me, you deferred your service until your first degree was finished, so long as there were no failures along the line. For those of us who were at university, um, it gave us time to figure out what was going on. Understand that at the time, that figuring out meant a rapid understanding of Asian history and geopolitics. As a consequence, universities actually became hotbeds during the period of agitation, organisation and resistance. By the mid-1960s in Australia, there were more students at university than ever before. Post-war, the Australian governments had uh, figured out that the national security and economic growth required more higher education. There'd been a post-war baby boom and uh, there had been accommodating expansions of school and the university systems. Initially, Australia's intervention in the war and conscription had widespread public support saying no to both conscription and the war uh, was no simple matter because it took place in a, a national culture profoundly ignorant of Asian history, societies and cultures. It was a national culture susceptible to uh, simplistic anti-communist Cold War rhetoric and domino theory political understandings. Initial opposition tend to be quietest and educational. The preferred mode of protest took the form of letters to the editor, petitions, small peaceful demonstrations, educated public meetings with guest speakers aiming for media coverage of uh, alternative ideas and the circulation of literature contesting government policies. The first voices raised and the actions against the war tend to come from long established political organisations and from activists with track records or family links to dissenting and oppositional pasts and from a, a peace movement with history that went right back to uh, 
uh, the beginning of the 20th century and the Boer War. But that was the quiet before the storm. And as the war dragged on and understandings grew, opposition intensified and, and, and grew. Protest actions became increasingly confrontational and disruptive. There was a mushroom growth of anti-war protest groups and organisations. And the uh, uh, cheap offset print technology produced a, a, a tsunami of protest literature and, and interesting and colourful layouts. Symbolic of the increasing militancy of the Australian uh, of this protest movement was the Australian tour of US President Johnson in October 66. While the Australian Prime Minister declared, and these are his actual words, all the way with LBJ um, out in the streets, protesters disrupted his cavalcade through paint over his car. There was police violence in retaliation. And in Sydney, the hosting premier uh, in the cavalcade instructed his driver to run over the bastards, meaning run over the protesters. The following year, the militant and powerful Seamen's Union of Australia dramatically placed bans on Australian merchant ships taking war materials to Vietnam. Producing a substantial and dramatic, dramatic shift in public opinion against the war was the Tet Offensive in February 68, this dramatically exposed the spurious we will win, we are winning claims of both the Australian and the US governments. So effective was mounting protest and opposition that in 1969, the federal government considered draconian legislation to curb free speech, the right of assembly, and uh, just ban anti-war protests generally. But it was a tide that couldn't be turned. In 1970 and 71, Australians turned out three times in tens of thousands of cities and towns across the nation in moratorium protests against the war and conscription. The largest of these took place in Melbourne and Victoria with an estimated, uh, and the estimation varied between 70,000 to 100,000 people in the street. By this time, the Australian government had uh, considered withdrawing from uh, uh, was considering withdrawal from Vietnam, but it had no time frame. And as far as the uh, moratorium protests were concerned, according to one of the leading government spokesmen, one of the leading ministers of the time, they were political bikies, pack raping democracy. There is actual words. These moratorium protests were a result of hard and difficult work by activists who managed to cobble together united action from uh, from amongst the many protest organisations and factions and interests across the nation uh, and mobilising people across divides of politics, ideology, race, gender, social class, religion. Amongst the early and high profile critics of Australia's involvement in the <laughs> Vietnam War and conscription were prominent members of the centre-left Australian Labor Party, Australia's oldest political party. The party had taken Australia through World War II, but it lost national office in 1949 in a federal election featuring a Cold War fear-mongering campaign launched by conservative forces and had been out of office ever since. And these early critics from the Labor Party, they are isolated voices within their party. It wasn't until much later that the Labor Party's leadership and rank and file had read the wind and efforts by anti-war and anti-conscription activists within the party were successful. In October 1969, the Labor Party promised to immediately withdraw Australian troops from the Vietnam War if it was elected in forthcoming elections. And in 1971, it promised to end conscription all of which immediately happened following its election to the leadership of the nation at the end of 1972. Overnight, the decision was made to bring the troops back. Conscription was ended, a, a, just a, a stroke of the pen. And as a bonus, all anti-war resistors who were in prison were released and there was a cancellation of a massive backlog of prosecutions of uh, activists yet to be arraigned. And uh, 
I will stop there. Uh, that's what I will say at the uh, present moment. Thank oh, you. Thank you very much for such a walkthrough of resistance and activity there. And congratulations to you for being a CEO and to other people in the peace movement in Australia. I've been lucky to be there three times. And first two times speaking towards against nuclear weapons and glad it continued after the war in Vietnam. Bobby, uh, you're up, you're in Perth and uh, we'd like to hear from you, please. Well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> I wanna thank the forum's organizers for inviting me to talk about Australian participation in the Vietnam War. I'm honored to do that. I am of the Vietnam War generation. My 20th birthday occurred in 1971. So had I been male, I would have been eligible for the infamous birthday ballot that Rowan has just described. I actually later found out that my birth date never appeared in any of those ballots by some miracle, but anyway. Unlike Rowan, therefore, I didn't go through the experience uh, firsthand. My knowledge comes from the research that I've done from my studies of conscientious objection and draft resistance, and actually that, that arose out of an interest in Gandhian nonviolence in India originally. Long before Australia's involvement in the Vietnam War, we had a peace movement. In fact, it dates from the early, as early as the 1880s, when one of the colonies first sent soldiers overseas to assist in a foreign war. And of course, in that case, and in most of the ones afterwards, it was the British Empire rather than the United States that Australian troops were fighting for. Some dissidents opposed all warfare, but more protest was directed against conscription for military service, either at home in Australia or for active service overseas. <clears throat> there was a small but vocal opposition to volunteer troops being sent to fight in South Africa in what's known as the Boer War at the turn of the century. Stronger opposition to a system of compulsory military training for boys from the ages of 14 to 18 before the First World War two very determined and successful campaigns to prevent soldiers being conscripted to fight overseas in World War I, unlike Britain, Canada and New Zealand, who all sent conscripts to the front in World War I. Our government had a referendum twice, and twice it was defeated. The First World War was the only occasion on which the Australian government attempted to send conscripted soldiers overseas until the Vietnam War. Thus, I suppose a combination of factors in the early to mid 1960s created a perfect storm for strong opposition to government policy on the war. Firstly, there was no evidence of Australia being threatened, although there was a compelling argument that if the communists succeeded in Vietnam, they would sweep down through Asia and be on our doorstep. And even worse than that, they were Asian communists. So combined the two great fears. Um, so that was one thing. And secondly, Menzies' Liberal Party government had reintroduced conscription in 1964 and then quickly announced that conscripted soldiers would be liable to fight in Vietnam. So that even some who supported the war and supported compulsory military training objected. Australians had always been fiercely proud that in two world wars, um, we fought with a volunteer army, the Australian Imperial Force. Initially though, opposition was fairly limited. Uh, here in Western Australia, anti-conscription groups began forming early in 1966. Save Our Sons, SOS, was formed first in New South Wales and Victoria, and a branch formed here in Perth in March 1966. It was a society of mothers who objected to their sons being conscripted. Well-dressed and carrying handbags, they staged silent vigils outside recruiting barracks but their quiet and orderly protests didn't stop them falling foul of the law. In Melbourne, five women were sent to Fairley Prison for 11 days on charges of will willful trespass because they gave leaflets out to men who were enlisting for national service. SOS was strictly non-violent, but one member of the Perth branch, Joan Davies, threw a shoe at the Prime Minister, Harold Holt, as he walked across the tarmac, you know, the same all the way with LBJ man. Um, he looked up and grinned at them standing on, the, on this balcony and it was too much for her and she threw a shoe at him and it hit the shoulder of one of his security de detail. Um, she was arrested, appeared in court and fined and the newspaper's headline in the account read, 
PM Smile Angered Perth Shoe Thrower. Other groups forming at this time were the Youth Campaign Against Conscription and the Vietnam Action Committee, and not all were committed to non-violent protest. The Youth Campaign Against Conscription, or YCAC, organised public protests where young men burnt their draft cards, and in many ways this became the iconic image of anti-war protest, someone holding up a burning draft card, and that was why when I wrote my book, Hell No, We Won't Go, I just could not resist this image of Andy Blondin burning his draft card outside the home, the Melbourne home of Harold Holt. In June 1966, Wycack led a big rally at Forest Place in the centre of Perth. About 500 people attended, which was quite a crowd for Perth in those days. Um, several of the conscripts burnt their draft cards. The rally turned violent when the police moved in and it became known rather dramatically as the Battle of Forest Place. Um, someone also burned a cross. They went up to the Kings Park War Memorial and put a cross in the ground and burned it. Um, Perth was, was and remains a very conservative city. College and university campuses were the focal point to resistance. In the 1960s, there was only one university, the University of Western Australia, but there was also the WA Institute of Technology, known by as an acronym, easy acronym WAIT, W-A-I-T, and the teachers' colleges, both UWA and WAIT became the scene of many demonstrations, including some featuring men who'd gone underground to avoid arrest. Later groups included the Draft Resistance Movement and Draft Resistors Union, and these, I think, were in all states, certainly very strong in Victoria, um, but um, not such a presence in, in Western Australia. Uh, and the difference between them and earlier groups was that their aim was not to protect individuals who were called up like the conscientious objectors support groups, but to smash the draft. In fact, there was an issue of the student paper Pelican at UWA with a clenched fist on it, smash the draft. So to, to get rid of the system, not just to, to protect those who, who wanted to protest against it. Mass resistance in the form of thousands refusing to register turning out in the streets in moratoriums, sit-ins and other demonstrations did influence public opinion, which gradually turned against Australia's involvement in the war. The first conscripted Australian soldiers arrived in Vietnam in April 1966, and the first conscript fatality, Errol Nowak, died possibly from friendly fire in May 1966. Although the official position was that conscripts had the choice of whether they volunteered um, for active, an active service unit, one of the men that I interviewed for my book, Hell No, We Won't Go, told me that this was far from the truth. He was placed in an infantry unit despite requesting a placement in a non-combat unit. He said, I was not offered a choice despite what the official records say. There used to be this idea that if you, if you volunteered for an active service unit, you would go to Vietnam, but if you volunteered for somewhere else, you wouldn't. And he said that was not the case. Several men I interviewed enlisted as soldiers when, when conscripted, but were sickened by the training and the attitude of their officers, all applied for and eventually got exemption as conscientious objectors. For those determined to flout the system by burning their draft cards and refusing to register or attend medical penalties were harsh. Initial fines and short periods in prison, usually seven days, were extended to up to two years for those who still refused to comply which basically was everyone. In my research, I did not find anyone who decided to enlist after being fined or jailed, even though that was obvi obviously the aim of the system. If you spend a week in jail, you'd be so terrified you'd go and enlist. Didn't work. Western Australia's longest serving prisoner was Gary Cook, an economics tutor at UWA. Although Cook registered and went for his medical, when ordered to report to barracks, he refused. He was tried in absentia in October 1970, having fled to Melbourne, where he stayed for several months. He marched in the Melbourne Moratorium in 1971, along with several other draft resistors who were avoiding arrest by going underground. Cook returned to Perth, was arrested, tried, and sentenced to two years in prison, later shortened to 18 months. So they served a prison term that was equivalent to the term they would have been in training. Um, in prison, he was beaten up. The experience was traumatic for him, and in later life, 
He never spoke of his anti-conscription stand or his time in jail. Another West Australian prisoner, Mike Payne, was sentenced to 18 months late in 1972. He and Cook were among the prisoners across Australia who were immediately released when Gough Whitlam's Labor Party won the 1972 election on the 5th of December. And I want to, in the last couple of minutes, I want to talk about the phenomenon that had arisen since the war, and that's the notion that returning soldiers were abused and attacked by protesters. The soldiers were given welcome home parades. At the first of these, a lone protester, Nadine Jensen, threw red paint over herself and some of the soldiers leading the parade outside the Sydney Town Hall. Um, for some reason, that protest has become a referred memory for others, as if it was a common thing for, to happen to protesters, uh, for protesters to commit such acts. It happened only once. In Adelaide, returning soldiers attacked protesters. In most cases, protesters called for the troops to be brought home. Um, often this was stated on marches, banners with messages such as, bring them home, bring our troops home. Newspapers were not censored, and if there had been big battles between soldiers and demonstrators, it would certainly have been reported, as was the incident in Adelaide. Later in the war, welcome home parades became rarer, but that was a policy determined by the government, not by the presence of thousands of angry demonstrators. Often small numbers of soldiers were flown home, rather than large numbers coming by ship, as had happened in the world wars. The myth of the much maligned Vietnam veteran is curious and is only just beginning to be investigated, both here and I believe in the US, but there is a credible notion that those who opposed the war felt liberated. This may be because they felt the anti-war movement actually achieved something. One former student protester, Michael Hyde, believed, we did actually help to stop the war in Vietnam. We also got people to look at the issue of US bases and how these things are interconnected. For the soldiers, however, participation in the war ultimately achieved nothing. So I'll close with the words of draft resistor Gary Hutchison, who said, if you didn't go to war, the experience had a positive, liberating effect. If you went to the war, the whole period had a traumatic result. The tragic thing is that a lot of kids went because they didn't think they had a choice. Thanks. Bobby, thank you so very much. That was, well, heart, heart striking. Uh, the, the number of military people who protested, the number of civilians who protested, how they switched some public opinion and gave even some momentum to other anti-militarism projects like the U.S. military bases there. I really appreciate the the eloquence, your book, and uh, I, I'll let you and Rowan know your your comments have created a couple of questions already. Let me just remind other members of the audience to send your questions as you are listening, and we will come back to those um, after the next presentation. Tim, Tim, Tim Shurrock is going to talk about how he knows South Korea and Japan from having lived there, and as being a lifelong anti-war activist and social justice uh, committed person. And he'll divide his time between the two as he wishes. So Tim, welcome, and we look forward to listening to you. Thank you very much, Terry. Uh, well, I'm gonna start with four points uh, about Japan and South Korea. First of all, the Japan Japanese anti-war movement, which I witnessed was one of the largest and in my opinion, most powerful in the world. It began during the early days of U.S. intervention in Vietnam shortly after the Korean War and continued through the 70s. It was largely focused on the role of U.S. military bases in Japan and Okinawa and the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, first signed in 1952 and renewed in 1960 and 1969. So basically it was a fight for peace in Japan and in Asia, as well as a struggle for independence from US control. The South Korean anti-war movement, on the other hand, was largely underground until the current uh, country won its democracy in the late 1980s. In the period after the Korean War and Vietnam, South Korea was under a military dictatorship led by General Park Chung-hee, who was in power for 18 years. 
open opposition to U.S. forces and holding anti-American views publicly was nearly impossible. And it got worse in the late 1960s when Pac sent troops to fight alongside U.S. counter the counter U.S. counterinsurgency forces in South Vietnam. So it was a fight for democracy, basically, that turned into a struggle uh, against against uh, U.S. military intervention, and then later for reparations for the Vietnamese people that the Korean military had uh, so injured and, 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 and actually slaughtered so many. Uh, third, these movements were linked to democratic struggles against the U.S. drive to militarize their, their countries and integrate them into the enormous U.S. military platform in East Asia. Unfortunately, that was a losing struggle because Japan now hosts the largest contingent of U.S. troops in the world and with South Korea not far behind. And the U.S. under its status of forces agreement with both countries continues to virtually occupy both of those countries militarily, particularly the islands of Okinawa. Uh, fourth, personally, uh, you know, like, like Terry said, I, I grew up in Japan and South Korea. My father uh, was a church relief uh, of, of worker with uh, the World Council of Churches and a large church organization called Church World Service. And uh, we actually Viet visited Vietnam in 1963 on our way back from uh, Switzerland, uh, where my dad was working with the World Council, back to Japan. And so I was there right before uh, that monk burned himself in the street of Saigon about a month before and, uh, you know, arrived in Japan right after that. And so I was well aware of Vietnam from a very, very young age. And my, my father got very involved in the anti-war movement uh, when he was, you know, teaching at Yale in the late 60s. And, and I got involved in while I was there. And I experienced and participated in the Japanese anti-war movement and also reported extensively on the South Korean uh, movement, uh, especially during the, during the 1980s. Uh, so a lot of my analysis is directly from my own observations and experiences. And like a lot of Australians, I too was subject to the draft and uh, managed to get a high number when there was a lottery. Uh, and I was involved in the US anti-war movement and specifically the Indochina peace campaign in Southern California until the very end of the war. Uh, and I just wanted to show you this. This was my, uh, get, get, you can, I don't know how you can see it in this, I'll turn off this light. Um, this was a demonstration of Americans in Tokyo, uh, 1968, uh, and my father helped organize it and was one of the lead speakers. Uh, the only FBI report I ever got about my father was about his speech at this thing, uh, where some uh, citizen decided to turn him into the FBI for attacking the US policy in Vietnam. But I'm in one of these pictures. That's that's me. I, I, it's really hard to point, but that's me right there, in, in a junior in high school. So that was my first uh, demonstration. Uh, but at any rate, uh, starting with Japan, uh, I have to go into sort of the the, the 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 role of these countries in the in the U.S. Cold War because from 1948 uh, was. The, after 1948, Japan was the keystone for U.S. military power in East Asia. That was the year that the U.S. reversed course in its occupation of Japan and moved from demilitarization to focusing on the containment of communism. And almost overnight, U.S. policy shifted from punishing the Japanese wartime officials responsible for World War II to enlisting them in the Cold War. And the shift was symbolized by Nobusuke Kishi, who was the prime minister from 1957 to 1960. Uh, he was the minister of commerce and industry in the wartime Tojo cabinet that declared war on the US and was labeled a class A war criminal for helping run Japan's colonial empire in Manchuria and Korea. But essentially what happened uh, was the, you know, these people decided, well, they'll just join with the US. Uh, while they were in prison. And then when it turned in, in, into the Cold War, they were enlisted. Uh, and Muto Ichio, who was a friend of mine and was one of the leaders of the Japanese anti-war movement, 
uh, he explained one to me that the part of Japanese imperialism, which was made powerless after the defeat in the war, wanted, of course, to revive itself. But they knew perfectly well that the situation had changed. They also knew that fighting against America would be both impossible and purposeless. So they adopted a clear cut strategy. Japan will concentrate on the buildup of the economic base structure of imperialism, while America will practically rule Asia through its military forces. And that in fact is what happened. Uh, Japanese industry profited handsomely by supplying the Pentagon with steel, munitions, and even napalm when the US was fighting wars in Korea and Vietnam. Then as Washington propped up Diem in South Vietnam, Pak Chung Hee in Korea, Marcos in the Philippines and Suharto in Indonesia. Uh, the U.S. gave them vast quantities of military aid while Japan kept their econ economies afloat uh, with financial aid and investments from large Japanese multinational companies. But the catalyst for this uh, policy was the Korean War, which was really a monumental shift in American policy in East Asia from the original uh, design of you know, peacemaker in Japan to building an empire. And it's important to remember that the Korean War, when it began in June 1950, uh, also began U.S. involvement in Vietnam. When Truman ordered U.S. ground troops into Korea, he also began aiding the French colonial army in, in Vietnam and, in, and also sent the Seventh Fleet into the Taiwan Straits to prevent China from completing its takeover of Taiwan. So <laughs> that, that's still going on. Um, in the Korean War was fought by U.S. forces. You know, there was U.S. forces on the ground in Korea, of course, but there, but all the air war, which was just terrible for Korea, was fought from Japan, the bases in Japan. And even today, the largest U.S. bases in Japan and Okinawa fly the U.N. flag as integral parts of the U.S. run U.N. command rear, which is established in Japan as the logistics and planning headquarters for the Korean War. And once the war ended in 1953, this whole network of bases that the U.S. had built became the perfect jumping off point for the war in Vietnam. And the Pentagon transformed its air and naval bases in Japan, Okinawa, and South Korea into a massive platform for regional war. And South Korea's role as a junior partner in this empire was sealed when its military rulers sent over 300,000 troops to back up the U.S. military in in Vietnam in 1965. After Nixon's shift toward Vietnamization in 1972, the Korean forces actually outnumbered American troops in Vietnam by a two to one margin. So they played a pretty important role in the, in the US uh, ground war in, in Vietnam. Now let me turn to the anti-war movement in Japan. Uh, it, like I said, began in Korea. A lot of Japanese people were very disturbed by the American use of their bases to bomb Korea and the enormous buildup of US forces in Okinawa. You have to remember that just five years before, 60 Japanese cities had been burned to the ground and you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki had been destroyed by the same B-29s that destroyed uh, Northern Korea and a lot of South Korea actually. Uh, and then in 1954, right after the Korean War, the US tested this hydrogen bomb uh, over Bikini, and that poisoned uh, some J uh, Japanese fishermen. And that was the uh, beginning of Japan's first a kind of anti-nuclear movement. It wasn't really directed at the US, but they wanted, that started this whole process of opposing uh, nuclear weapons in Japan, um, uh, triggered obviously by, by Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But in terms of a movement, it, re it, it, it really began in, uh, I would say in 1956, uh, at this base called Tachikawa that wasn't very far from my house in, in Western Tokyo. I could literally see it from my back porch in the 60s. Uh, in, in 1955, right after the bikini explosion, the US military announced plans to use Tachikawa for transporting nuclear weapons. And they wanted to, it had to you know, get the surrounding farmland and extend the runways. And, and this started a huge movement Farmers, villages, students, trade unionists, Buddhist priests began a campaign of nonviolent protests and occupation of the, of the land. And tens of thousands eventually joined these protests, which forced the US military to cancel the expansion of this base. But after that, 
They simply built bases for nuclear bombers in Okinawa, which remained under US military rule until 1972. And the anti-basis struggle in Tachikawa set the, pro set the pattern for many of the protests during Vietnam. Uh, by 65, Japan's prime minister was Sato, Kishi's brother. He was a big cheerleader for the US war in Vietnam and uh, LBJ loved him for that reason. But to millions of Japanese, he was just a warmonger. They were, they were ashamed their land was being used as a base to bomb and lay waste to another Asian country like they did in Korea. And as Japanese reporters began sending back stories from South Vietnam of the extensive US bombing and the brutality of General Westmoreland search and destroy operations, public op opposition grew to the war and Japan's complicity in it. Most of the early demonstrations were organized by the old left made up of the old communist party and its affiliated unions. But by 1967, the war was this huge issue in Japan and a rallying cry and symbol of the Japanese new left and the student movements. Uh, one, one of the things that really brought people into the streets was the desertion of sailors from the Intrepid, a US Navy aircraft carrier and a port call to the southern port of Sasebo by the Enterprise, the nuclear powered carrier that was leading the airborne assault on North Vietnam. This movement was much broader than the left-wing student and labor groups and included housewives, environmentalists, and farmers. And, and it, was, it was incredible to me as a you know, middle school kid and high school kid to, 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 to read about these and see the, these demonstrations by ordinary, ordinary Japanese. Uh, the, the best known of the anti-war organizations was called Beheiden, which meant Peace in Vietnam Committee. Uh, it was led in part by Muto, who I just uh, quoted from, and I mentioned him earlier. It was organized to create links between the Japanese movement and any war forces in the U.S. and Europe. Beheiden came to national attention when those four airmen uh, from the Intrepid deserted their posts and sought assistance from the group many of whom spoke English. And by the, by the way, this, this magazine, Ampo, is what they published this in English for quite a few years. And uh, it was a great magazine that just told you all about the people's struggles in Japan and, and also around Asia that, that you know, Japanese corporations were involved in. Uh, but through Beheiren, eventually hundreds of American deserters escaped from Vietnam. And many of them ending up in the Soviet Union, Sweden, and other places. Behaden housed the deserters and kept them out of the clutches of US naval and army intelligence. Uh, eventually they would go to Hokkaido in the far north and board fishing boats or other vessels and get to the Soviet Union and then take the train across to Sweden. Um, the interesting thing was when the US demanded that Japan crack down on this, the Japanese government told them, well, Sorry, but there's no law against Japanese citizens uh, bringing foreigners to another part of Japan and putting them on a boat. So there, there was nothing they could do about it, but it, it did increase you know, surveillance of this group. Um, but it, it was also during this time that US activists, including one who's, who's on this, on this uh, conference, I think, Ed Kinchley, uh, they were funded to, to build, to, to, to create coffee houses around bases in Japan and Okinawa uh, to support active duty GIs who were protesting the war, of, of which there were quite a few, particularly in, in Japan that, that, you know, where they were involved in the war. And then uh, I have to mention in Japan too, the role of labor unions, especially socialists and communists were very involved in the anti-war movement. And this was especially true in, Vietnam, in Okinawa where base workers organized on the U.S. bases, and, and like in 1972, they went on strike, and uh, under you know the U.S. military called up the AFL-CIO, the U.S. Labor Umbrella Organization, and they sent top officials to help break the strike. Great role by the U.S. unions there, uh, although there was a few unions that did oppose the war. Uh, the, the the movement kind of culminated in 68, 69, uh, with massive demonstrations against the war and the the renewal of the Japan's Security Treaty. And I witnessed quite a few of these demonstrations and they're still the largest ones I've ever seen in my life. And incidentally, at that time also hundreds of universities were seized by student radicals at against the war, including the university where my father at that time was vice president of. Uh, stu student radicals held it for almost three years. 
And uh, because of World War II police, secret police, the Japanese were reluctant to send in the police, but eventually at that university, after my father left, they, they were called in. But this was a huge movement that just swept all through Japan and even at some of its most conservative uh, universities. Now, Korea, of course, was a really different situation. Uh, you know, it, it was under dictatorship for most of this time. In 1960, the dictator Sigmund Rhee was overthrown. The U.S. was happy about that. He was anti-Japanese. Uh, and, and the U.S. flew him out of the country in a CIA plane. And, and then over the next few years, Koreans began to call for a neutral, unified Korea. They wanted, you know, all foreign troops out. And you know, also they wanted justice for a lot of civilians who'd been executed during the Korean War. Uh, but all that came to a stop when Park Chung-hee declared uh, martial law in 1961 and took over in a military coup. And uh, four years later, under pressure from the U.S., he signed a normalization treaty with Japan that this was signed during the war in Vietnam. And the U.S. wanted, desperately wanted Japan and Korea to link up so Japan could provide financial and, uh, you know, loans and investments uh, while the U.S. was building up its forces in, in, in Vietnam. Uh, but there was huge demonstrations, both in Japan and Korea, against this security treaty. And, and one of the protest slogans in Korea was the U.S. is not our master. And they were spot on because, you know, the U.S. wanted this treaty because it was bogged down in Vietnam and needed military help and economic assistance. Um, and that was the year 65 that Pak sent the first Korean troops to Vietnam. And they were responsible for many massacres and in some towns and villages were considered even worse than U.S. troops. By, nine, by, not, by 1973, 3, 000, over almost 4,000 Korean soldiers had been killed, 9,000 wounded. The figures were never made public. The dead were returned secretly to a U.S. Air Force base. Foreign reporters were prohibited from photography, you know, taking pictures. And all reports, of course, of atrocities were censored. Uh, protests were basically impossible. Uh, and then in 72, Hawk feared that Nixon, when he was doing his Vietnamization, feared Nixon was going to pull out of Korea. Uh, and uh, actually, Nixon did pull out a whole division of American troops from Korea in 72. This freaked out the, the Korean uh, government. And uh, he declared martial law again and really uh, transformed South Korea into what I would call one of the world's first torture states. I mean, the, the draconian system there is uh, incredible from the 70s. Executions, uh, hundreds of people, you know, summarily arrested and ma many, many tortured and just a, just a terrible situation for the Korean people. And even in Park's hometown, people, peasants demonstrated against him. Uh, but in 79, he was assassinated, and over the next year, another general, Korean general, one of many trained by the U.S. to fight in Vietnam. He had served in Vietnam under the U.S. He took over in a military coup in, in uh, 79, lasting into 1980, slaughtering lots of people on the way in the city of Gwangju, uh, which was the first armed revolt against uh, in Korea since the Korean War. The U.S. covered up his crimes as usual and threw its support to him, as did the LDP Japanese leaders in, in Tokyo. But inspired by this uprising in Gwangju, Korean citizens organized and fought against the dictatorship, and they finally won their democracy in 1987. And when that happened, when the, you know, when the democracy came, came, the press was finally able to investigate all kinds of things from the past, including the role of Korean troops in Vietnam. And so in 1999, the first paper to break a major story about massacres by Korean forces was Han Kyo Day, which was a newspaper founded uh, by opposition journalists who'd been purged from the media during the 70s and early 80s. And they reported on an incident from 68 in which Amer Korean Marines uh, had uh, slaughtered about 70 people in this little village called Phong Ni. And there were similar massacres of civilians by Korean troops in about 80 places during the Vietnam War, with a death toll estimated about 9,000 civilians were killed, which is almost three times the number of Korean soldiers who were killed. Uh, and 
so then after these stories came out after a period of years where Korean citizens organized several organizations to support the Vietnamese victims, including the Civil Society Network for a Just Resolution to the Vietnam War and Korea Vietnamese Peace Foundation. And they had traveled to Vietnam to visit sites of the massacres and meet victims. And in 2020, uh, one of these organizations helped a Vietnamese victim from one of the massacres file a damages lawsuit in Seoul. And in 2023, the Korean uh, ju uh, judge ruled the veracity of her claims and ordered the government to pay her about $23,000 in restitution. Um, and many other claims like this have been made, but the current South Korean government, which is very right wing and pro-American has refused to pay and it's of course appealing. But in the end, the Japanese and Korean movements were quite effective in building democracy in their own country and reigning in US power. Yet, as I said today, nearly 50 years after Vietnam's liberation, both countries are now heavily militarized and are in a three-way military alliance with the US that continues to dominate Asia and threatens war with, North, with China and North Korea. But the resistance continues in Japan, primarily in Okinawa, uh, in which you probably, you, you, we read about it here a lot because you know, this is a, in, in, in Okinawa, the governor himself and many of the people oppose the you know, US Marines being there and want them removed finally. Uh, and that's it, but the U U.S. refuses and continues to expand. Uh, and many Koreans active in the democracy movement from the 1980s, which became very anti-American toward its end, are still speaking out against U.S. policy. And in my opinion, both movements built strong ties with Vietnam that remain. And in, I, I think that's really in contrast to the U.S. anti-war movement, which in my opinion, abandoned Asia after Vietnam and basically left the region to the Pentagon and the U.S. right. And, and I think that's why American policy in Asia is so screwed up is, you know, the anti-war movement here just finally said, well, it's time to focus on what's going on at home, which was true in a lot of ways, but, but they never got involved. And so like, you know, the Korean struggles, you know, other struggles in Asia just passed them by and they weren't involved at all. So I, I think that was, really uh, positive uh, actions by the Korean and Japanese movements. And I'll end there. Thank you. Well, Tim, uh, thank you very, very much. Wow, that felt almost like a teach-in. And <laughs> we learned so much about the segue from the war in Korea to the Vietnam War and how early the United States was getting involved in Vietnam. Uh, you know, the the, the war and the anti-war movement are not really taught in our history here in the United States. And when it is, it's not very accurate or or informed. Um, we know that uh, the French government and the U.S. government were talking about the possibilities of the United States giving France nuclear weapons to use in Vietnam before Dien Bien Phu of 1945. Uh, Nixon liked that idea. Uh, uh, Eisenhower to put a kibosh on it, uh, and certainly can understand, you know, the anti-American opposition, the anti-American sentiment about bases and using Japan as a as a runway air force to sort of further attack Southeast Asia. Um, but I do want to ask you one question, and then a, then a question for Rowan and, and Bobby um, about in Australia. So you mentioned the massacre that South Korean troops committed in 1968, which was the same year that the My Lai massacre occurred in July. And we were lucky through a friend of ours, Cy Hirsch, to know about that a couple of years later. You had to wait till 1999 to know about it in, in, in South Korea. The, the Pentagon would say after that that it was simply an accident when in fact the Pentagon had records of over 200 massacres like My Lai. Can I just ask you, uh, what, 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 what impact did that news have when you learned it in 1999? And, and, and I understand the, the lack of democracy to be sort of in the streets and vocal and so forth, but what, 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 what shaping of a public opinion happened when that was learned? And has there been anything to sort of like mitigate what happened or, or express remorse? 
Well, well, actually, I learned a lot of Amer Americans learned about the Korean massacres from particularly this report. Um, let me see there. Here we go. Uh -huh. uh, this was written by Frank Baldwin and uh, Diana Michael Jones, who were there. Uh, Frank Baldwin lived in Japan for a long time, and Diana Michael Jones were with a religious group in Vietnam, and they they really did. You know, they heard about massacres of Korean by Korean troops. And they really investigated. And this and this uh, report, I forget when this came out. I think it was in the late seventies. But uh, you know, I, I, some of the, there were people that smuggled this into Korea. Uh, you had to really smuggle a lot of stuff in there during the dictatorship. It was it was very difficult to share information because of that. Uh, and and uh, so Koreans learned. Some Koreans knew about. And, and of course, you know, Korean troops would come back. And they would tell stories, right? Just like right. here. And and yeah. so when this came, when this you know these reports came out in 1999. And by the way, some of these reports were based on Korean reporters not only going to Vietnam but digging into the U.S. national archives, the, the military archives, and the national archives, you know, to find uh, you know reports about you know the, the Korean military working for the U.S. military and uh -huh. and so when when this came out in 1999 it was it was a few years after uh, there had been a huge kind of public uprising in South Korea against um, rapes by American soldiers of of Korean girls uh, around U.S. bases and of course the whole sexual exploitation around U.S. bases and so. People began to connect what had happened, what was happening to their country, uh, then with what had happened in Vietnam before, and right. so it, it 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 created a very strong solidarity movement in a lot of you know lots of cities, you know established sister relationships, and lots of Korean citizens have gone to Vietnam, and a lot of soldiers have come out and said you know what what they you know told stories about what they did and what they witnessed. And uh, that woman who won the the law lawsuit, like you know, she was supported at her trial. There was a Korean soldier who was involved in the massacre, who okay. who, who testified. So you know, it really had quite an quite an effect, and it was very uh, kind of astonishing in, in some Good. ways. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to save your last comment for us to come back to, and that was a, a, a productive critique of how we lost track of Asia. The peace movement in the United States did move into opposing nuclear weapons, especially the ones that were happening in Europe, and it did have, you know, a, a life after Vietnam. But I'm going to ask other people, and maybe we can find people in the audience who can comment on that. Let me ask Rowan and Bobby for also uh, an answer. Um, people are asking about the, the Labor Party and organized labor in your country and somehow, and I think positively so, see it as more of a beacon than what our labor movement was, which was also patriotic, sort of like what happened to some people when they came back home in Australia. There were people who supported the war uh, and as patriot and, and ones who were um, more mindful and opposed it. Can you talk about the role of the Labor Party before 1972 and the role of organized labor? How 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 much of a leadership or how instrumental? I know there was a change in party, but how instrumental was that to affecting public opinion and anti-war sentiment? Either one of you. Well, well I, I'll go first. I think I, uh, my first job after university was working with the Siemens Union of Australia. Uh, one of the key militant unions in Australia. Um, Australia has always had, until recent times, a high union density. Uh, in the 1960s, it was 55%. Uh, the Australian Labor Party uh, emerged out of the uh, trade union conflicts of the uh, 19th century, um, the 1890 struggles in Australia between capital and labour turned violent, almost armed violence um, in some regions in Australia. Um, the the labour movement at the end of the, that colonial period decided to try to seek uh, parliamentary uh, representation um, in 1901, the Labor Party emerged and was created out of the labor movement 
and the labor movement through uh, had a significant influence on the shape and destinies of the, uh, uh, the, the Labour Party in terms of uh, there, there was a, a, a socialist platform right through much of the uh, early part of the 20th century in the ALP's uh, actual uh, uh, platform. Um, the Labour Party has tried to separate itself from the trade union movement in many ways, but it still remains uh, uh, oh. very much influenced by it. The trade union movement um, has had a very militant wing um, during the late, from the late uh, 30s into the 1940s. Key unions had uh, communist leadership, particularly in the mining unions and the waterfront unions and the uh, maritime unions. And the trade union movement in Australia has done brilliant stuff. So, for example, um, it helped create modern Indonesia, for God's sake. Um, during World War II, the, the Dutch government uh, relocated in face of the uh, Japanese uh, invasion to Australia and, 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 and was the Dutch and brought with it uh, infrastructures and everything. And it was a, the, the, the Dutch government in exile from the Netherlands East Indies was in okay. Australia. Okay. When it tried to return at the end of World War II, the Australian unions held up all their bloody shipping and held it here for a, a number of years and, and even helped the Indonesian movement uh, uh, organise. And uh, there's even evidence that uh, there was a lot of communists in the Australian army during the Second World War, mm. and there was a leakage of arms from uh, Australian soldiers to Indonesian nationalists. Okay, well, uh, let me let me just ask you. That, that's quite helpful. Let, let's, Bob, Bobby. How about you on organized labor in the Labor Party? Can you say a little more, or, or was that exhaustive? I can, I can say some more. Go ahead. Well, the Labor Party has affiliated unions and always has had. And in fact, in Western Australia, the Labor Party and the union movement were the same movement right up until the end of the up until 1960s. We didn't have an independent trades and labor council. So in the West, in West, it was very strong connection. If you weren't, um, it basically, if you weren't in um, the union that was affiliated, you had no say in anything. So um, that was partly to to um, keep the communists out. <laughs> but okay. uh, the other the big difference, I think, between here and the US is that the US, I gather, has never had a Labor Party or never had a, a major Labor Party, whereas uh, the Labor, the Australian Labor Party here is the oldest political party. It was mm. formed in 1891, and it has never ceased to be a party ever since, whereas the opposition, the conservative opposition, has taken the form of many different parties until the 1940s when Menzies formed the so-called Liberal Party, which is really a conservative party, but he chose to call it Liberal Party. Um, the Liberal Party is in an, a permanent a coalition federally with the National Party, which is a party of country people, used okay. to be called the Country Party. So they are more conservative than liberals, if anything. Um, and Labor, Rowan is right, has moved certainly into the middle of the road more than left wing, but most p p prime ministers have a union background or, uh -huh. or leaders of the Labor Party, depending on whether it's a right wing union like the AWU or a left-wing union like Wharfies, um, but it, they always have a union connection and they also receive money from the affiliated yeah. unions. Um, so I don't know how much that answers your question, but no, it's helpful. interesting, sorry, that Whitlam actually was not originally in favour of withdrawing from Vietnam, but he was convinced. He, the previous leader, Caldwell, was very strongly anti-Vietnam, but Whitlam had to be persuaded so when he saw the way that the the popular sentiment was going, Good. he changed his mind. Yeah, I wish we'd have had a president at that time that would do the same. But I can also say we have a liberal party that's pretty conservative too. So uh, <laughs> you're not the only one. Do we, uh, we the, the audience is learning about how troops from Australia fought with the United States against the Vietnamese. 
and how troops in South Korea fought with the United States against the Vietnamese. There were other countries, the Netherlands, Thailand, Canada, etc. We have several questions about the role of anti-war activity within the military. You've talked about some Australia uh, of examples of resistance and so forth. And uh, Tim, you could talk about South Korea, if you will, although given the limitations on freedom of expression, that's quite different. But how strong was the opposition to the war and by the by soldiers? And how was that expressed or was it expressed in, 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 in significant ways uh, in your media and in your public opinion? Because it's felt in the United States that that was very significant when it began to happen in the late 60s. And Terry, add to that question what has also been asked. How much did veterans then play a role, especially in Australia, in the anti-war movement? John, thanks. So Bobby, why don't you go first on this one, then Tim, then Rowan. I, I personally am not that sure. Um, certainly the people that I interviewed or surveyed for my book uh, who were uh, withdrawn from the military um, became, got conscientious objector status. But I don't know that most of them actually then went out in the street and demonstrated. Um, and and I should say, too, that I think our anti-war movement here was tended to be divided between those who originally did the right thing, I suppose you could say, and registered and then saw, and then applied to be conscientious objectors, um, and those who went out to smash the draft, which was basically doing none of those things, refusing to register, refusing to, um, when they were caught up with, refusing to um, go for a medical or, or um, enlist, and they were the ones who normally ended up in jail. So in that sense, I would say that um, I didn't feel that there was a strong um, okay. anti-war resistance. So there were times when soldiers, previous soldiers spoke out against conscription, like people who'd served in the Second World War, for instance, um, sometimes opposed conscription. Because in Australia, um, in the Second World War, you could be, you could be conscripted to serve at home. Um, you just couldn't be conscripted to serve overseas. I see, thank you. Tim, uh, could there have been and was there any opposition within the South Korean military to its participation in Vietnam? I would not. I don't think so. It was, you know, it was it was a dictatorship inside Korea. You can yeah. imagine that it was a dictatorship inside the military. That yeah. probably would have gotten you executed. Uh, but but people did come back later, like a lot of American vets did, and you know, speak out about what they'd seen and 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 participated in. Um, let me just say one thing about the U.S. labor movement and the Korean War. That's, you know, the Korean War was, you know, same time as McCarthyism and the crackdown in general on the left. And a lot of unions were just ripped apart by this anti-communist urge. And that happened right, you know, during the Korean War. And, you know, especially like, you know, I've covered maritime unions as a reporter for years. And like, you know, the National Maritime Union like the Australian Maritime Union used to be a really militant uh, union, but it was crushed and you know it went from communist leadership to totally fiercely anti-communist, almost fascist leadership. And that happened to several unions and many unions, industrial unions were actually split between sort of more left wing and, and right wing. Uh, and then, you know, during the Vietnam War, uh, some locals did speak out, but not you know, the national AFL-CIO and the national labor movement's job, you know, they were getting money from the government to make sure that unions in other countries like Japan and Korea were pro-U.S. And they really, you know, intervened just like, you know, the U.S. US government did. Um, yeah. And the last thing is, uh, in terms of soldiers, uh, there was active duty GIs that, you know, participated in anti-war activities. Ed Kinchley, who was on the line, you know, may want to raise his hand and, and talk a few minutes a minute or so about that but in one time when, when in 1969 uh between leaving japan and going to college in the u.s i spent the summer in hawaii and that summer uh i was working at this church called church of the crossroads and that summer 
uh, one American was on eight was, you know, was uh, on vacation in Hawaii from Vietnam. He took refuge in this church. And about a weekend, the next weekend, we held a march uh, to support him. And about 10 other soldier active duty guys from Vietnam, you know, went to the church and, and, and took yeah. refuge. And that lasted for, you know, and there was this, you know, people left and, and just like they did getting out of, you know, through Japan. I mean, people would get up, go on R&R &R and get the hell out. Yeah. Tim, we're sure about the active GI movement and, and veterans in the United States who participated. But let me ask you, uh, Rowan, can you say a little more about either current existing military in the service during the war and veterans at that time, what their voices were and where they, if they were opposed, were they being heard? I did some research ages ago and uh, uh, I found a couple of examples of uh, uh, alleged examples of attempts at fragging. Uh, that's uh, rolling grenades yeah. into tents and blowing them up. That very few and far between. Uh, the Australian mil military historically has uh, avoided talking about dissent and mutiny. Um, in World War I, we didn't execute people like the uh, British did for uh, uh, disobedience. Did you freeze there, um, Rowan? You're okay. That? You're okay. Yep. We, you froze for a second or two. All right. And anyway, right. what we what we what our military tends to do is if there is dissent in the ranks, we explain it and hide it with medical reasons. Right? Further so that <laughs> if, if, if you express dissident uh, views or something like that, um you're not challenging military authority in any way. You're, you're sick, and they take that mental uh, route so that there were actually, in, in our history, particularly during World War I, uh, there were a number of large-scale mutinies, but these have always been explained away. We also have a, uh, a, a, a national culture where it is you're proud to be a warrior it's called the anzac tradition and so a great deal of money is spent and there's a lot of deal of politics making soldiers proud and encouraging soldiers to be proud of the, their war service and so um the answer is is no um Okay. Since the Vietnam War, there has been a number of senior people, senior officers, who have recollect, who have expressed their uh, uh, criticisms of their time as military officers and the leadership, but uh, they never pushed it, and they never made a public stand. They made criticisms within the army through the channels. Yeah but they looked after and nursed their careers. Uh-huh. Thank you. Listen, I do want to move on to another topic, but Ed. Ed uh, Terry, uh, yeah. Ed Kinchley. Yeah, I, I see it. Uh, I see him, John. Okay. Say, uh, Ed, if you can hear me, can you, do, can you do something in one or two minutes, please? Sure. How, how do, what do I do? Yeah, you're talking. Keep just talking. Talk. Okay. I, I just want to say that um, from... For in my personal experience, from around 1972 through 76, from North Carolina and later in Japan, um, I worked with active duty, mostly Marines, um, who were opposed to the war. And clearly that was the later end of anti-war, anti-Vietnam War activity um, because of when I got involved. Um, but it's still had great impact on um, both the people who were participating in it. And I, I think in the United States, it's fair to say that, I mean, John Kerry is, is probably the, the most famous example, but there were hundreds, thousands of right. people who came back from the war and publicly said, you know, I don't want these medals. I'm not proud of what I did. We right. should stop what, our, what we're doing. And, and I think had real influence on U.S. policy. Thanks, That's really all I wanted to say. Thank you. 
Listen, thank you for doing that. And thanks for sharing that too. So I don't, I don't want this to be the last question because there's still a couple more, but I do want to segue into this. And it has to do with the comment that Tim made about what happened to the anti-war movement after 1975. And I'm going to ask you what happened in Japan, South Korea, and Australia. So be prepared to answer that question. In the United States, as I mentioned, there was a big shift to anti-nuclear weapons and that eventually culminated in a Central Park rally of about 1.2 million people and policy that changed thereafter. However, there, there were people such as John, and I'll invite him to speak to this after, after we hear from you, that still continued it, about Indochina, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, about unexploded ordinances, Agent Orange, finding the remains of uh, people. And there's been a lot of cooperation between NGOs and even some uh, corporate business interests in trying to change what is our legacy in Indochina, uh, et cetera. First of all, it, it, I'm going to ask you, you now, uh, and we'll start with uh, Bobby, if it's OK. Can, can you talk about, after this happened, what the impact of the anti-war movement was on Australia, and what happened in peace and justice movements after that? Where did you go? What did you do? How did it help make that happen? Well, it turned into a more of an anti-nuclear um, protest movement, I think. And um, as you were talking, I was reminded of a wonderful picture of Joe Valentine, who was the senator for nuclear disarmament, which later morphed into the Greens Party that still has members in Parliament, um, standing down at Fremantle Wharf opposing the US ships coming in because, you know, the... the the policy was we would not confirm or deny whether they're nuclear armed ships. And um, there were there were people that went out to Pine Gap and, and had a protest camp there um, and up to Northwest Cape with an American base. So I think it took um, a lot of a lot of um, the effort went into opposing nuclear weapons and US bases in Australia. Okay. And uh, then when Australia was involved in the the Iraq war, certainly there were marches, um, and I took part in marches against the war. And one of the interesting things about that was it was very um, much we don't want our troops to be involved. So it was, it was very supportive. of It wasn't anti-army. It was anti the troops being sent overseas to other people's wars. Okay. And um, But one of the things I really noticed on those marches were the number of grey heads <laughs> is that there weren't so many young people on them, whereas uh, the the um, protests that really attract young people, I find, are the G8 and the Palestine movement now and that kind of thing. So I don't know whether Rowan's seen it differently, but that's that was the thing that really struck me at that time, and that was around the turn of the 21st century. Glad to hear that. I'm, I'm glad to hear that they had hair because, you know, it can be worse. <laughs> Rowan, can you say a little more about what you saw peace and justice movements after 1972, 1975? Yeah, well, I, I saw some research recently, an analysis of uh, uh, thousands of uh, illustration photographs taken at the time in the State Library of uh, New South Wales of the protest movement at the, in, the, in the late 70s. And this researcher uh, did an examination of the placards and that. And in those anti-war demonstrations by that time, you also saw people marching with anti-apartheid in South Africa uh, posters, anti-junta in Greece posters. Uh, the the, the anti-war movement in Australia uh, was an educating lesson in hands-on democracy. We had a society where... Uh, we had been trained in the up to the 1950s, us young ones anyway, uh, uh, that democracy was something you voted for once every three years and then you went quiet. Uh -huh. The, the anti-war movement showed that democracy was an ongoing process. You intervened, that public places were forums for uh, dissent and opposition, that struggle was the way you could produce social change and it had a liberative effect on uh, uh, women's rights, gay rights, uh, 
environmentalism, the whole lot. And they gifted that to the future. And the young people, even today in Australia now, are learning from that. And they're out in their thousands. I can feel the energy here. I can feel the energy. Tim, do you want to say anything more? You said quite a bit about what happened after after Vietnam in Japan and South Korea. Do you want to say anything more before I ask John? Well, uh, it, it, first of all, in, in Korea, of course, when the South Vietnam collapsed in 75, uh, Park Chung-hee just turned on the heat in South Korea. We can't, you know, we, this can't happen in, in Korea, et cetera, et cetera. And the U.S. actually began building up its its own forces. Even though it had pulled some out, it had started to increase the, the uh, cooperation with the South Korean military after Vietnam collapsed after it pulled out. Uh, Japan, uh, the, the movement, uh, you know, was very powerful, like I said, in 69, 70 against the security treaty. But the thing is that the Japanese, they, they had massive demonstrations. And the Japanese government, what they did at one point was they just sort of depopulated the city, downtown Tokyo. So there was no one to demonstrate to. And 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 they kind of took the wind out of it. And, and, and but Japanese activists, began to turn toward countries that J Japanese corporations had built, you know, mining facilities and, you know, agriculture and, you know, began to support people in direct ways. And, and, and they began to really expand their, their solidarity work among lots of different countries. Like, you know, like here, Ampo here, you know, this was a few years yeah. later after Vietnam, they were focusing on the Philippines. Um, mm. and, 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 and it really created a, a, a mass movement to support Third world, you know, activists in in places around Asia. Last thing I'll say, you know, my own experience was, you know, I remember being in a meeting in the Indochina peace campaign just after the, you know, Vietnam had been liberated, and we're and everyone's going, you know, what's next? And I said, well, you know, there's still incredible repression in South Korea and a huge, massive U.S. military force there, you know, that's still going on. And, you know, I think we should focus on that. And they're like, no, 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 no. We got to focus on America, you know, leave it yeah. behind. And, and you know, I, I distinctly remember that. And that's what, one of the reasons I got into looking and in, in investigating what was actually going on in, in South Korea. And, and, and uh, I'm still doing that. Yeah. But I think it was a real mistake of the U.S. movement to, like I said, to just leave Asia behind and, and, and cede it to the Pentagon and the right wing. I mean, it's still the, the case now. Uh, and, and, and a lot of Americans have no understanding of, uh, on the left, have no understanding of, you know, you know okay. the US military role in Japan or, or Korea. Okay. Let me say I'm also grateful to the, the Hibakusha and others in Japan about their anti-nuclear activities. And Absolutely. still, I think I led five delegations to Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the late 70s and the first two years of the 80s. So that was certainly... Uh, important. So John, I'm going to just uh, echo. So did the anti-Vietnam, anti-Indochina war movement turn its back on Asia? Well, let me first go back and try and put a pin on an earlier discussion. I gather, or the impression I'm getting is there was no equivalent of Vietnam veterans against the war in Australia. That is, organized veterans playing an active role in the peace movement. Is that correct? Because we, we had that question. And I think I just wanted to be sure that the lack of an answer is that, in fact, it didn't exist. Yeah, I, I, I just make one comment that I missed out on, that World War II veterans were prominent in the anti-war movement. But not Vietnam and, uh, veterans. No. And the, the 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 presence of those, you know, well, I was personally helped in my life by an ex-British commando who had been trained to operate between behind enemy lines. He became one of my protectors and uh, helped me get free legal advice um, amongst the leadership. Uh, of one of the anti-war uh, movements was a highly decorated uh, Battle of Britain uh, veteran, um, another prominent uh, senior member of the anti-war movement uh, was a 
a prisoner of war on the Burma, uh, uh, on that Burma railroad. The World War II veterans were there, not in great numbers, but significantly so. Thank you. Okay, well, let me answer, but, or unless Bobby has anything. I mean, again, I, I just, you're saying that there was no organized Vietnam veterans. Well, a couple of things. One is that I think there's actually some research being done about that now that I was at a, a workshop the other day that somebody mentioned it um, about how hard it has been to actually get uh, a veterans um, peace movement going from anti from post from Vietnam War veterans, but it's early research, so I can't really comment on it. Um, but why I put my hand up was because I noticed, I actually um, read um, something in the chat that said, what about the Green Bands? And I thought that's a, a movement that's worth mentioning, which was a union-led movement in the 70s opposing um, development in heritage sites, particularly in Sydney um, and Melbourne, where old places were being demolished and, um, and new structures built. And that was quite a big... Um, big, strong union-led movement um, at that time. Eric, to answer more directly, Terry, the first, a slight side issue, which is the place that I think a lot of anti-Vietnam energies went was to Central America mm -hmm. and was the Sandinistas and the wars that Reagan uh, and Bush were doing. I mean, that was that was where, in a sense, Tim, the transition got made. Um, and there was some South Africa or Southern Africa stuff too, but it was more Central America where you had that same energy. But also, I would not underestimate the insularity of the United States <laughs> when, when an issue is not thrust into our face. Um, yeah, we look. We tend to look internally, whether that's on the left or on the right. Um, the I, we're about done, so I wanted to do three footnotes that relate to your question, Terry. One is the Rowan, the Diane and Michael Jones were American Friends Service Committee. Right. They were the Quakers. They worked, or is it Tim? Whoever mentioned that they had Tim mentioned that they had worked in in Vietnam during the war and were very active when they came back speaking, working against the war. Um, the other footnote <laughs> that is interesting is that I did, a, what Terry's referring to is I did a lot of post-war normalization work from 75 to 95. And two interesting subtexts, one was South Korean. The South Koreans and particularly Korean airlines got into Vietnam ahead of any American business. And South Korean investors went into Vietnam ahead of American business. And part of it is the same phenomena that we saw in the normalization movement here, that veterans, for whatever the pluses and minuses of their role in the war were, had formed a kind of emotional bond. <laughs> they were motivated to want to get in there. And, and my wife and I were actually used in South Korea to convince foreign ministry people and uh, I'm sure intelligence people that the US was on the verge of normalizing with Vietnam <laughs> and, so that they could get an excuse to go ahead and do it. The other thing is Australia. Um, one of the Australian diplomats in Saigon during the war was a man named Graham Aliband. He became then Australia's ambassador to Hanoi. And in the mid 80s, when we started organizing trips that were for educators and others and were moving, as Terry saying, it was sort of the, the residual Vietnam movement was very interested in normalization. And so we brought people to uh, Graham's residence um, and also the Swedish embassy to try to provide a Western viewpoint about why normalization <laughs> made sense. 
Uh, and they, the Australians and the Swedes played a very important contributing role in creating that atmosphere that, that it was silly that it took us 20 years to get to normalization with Vietnam. Of course, it's been 60 years with Cuba. So, uh, you know, 20 seems relatively little in the scale of things, but we did get to normalization uh, with Vietnam and now it's a st comprehensive strategic partner. And <laughs> the, Terry was at a conference where we now hear people from the Pentagon and the State Department saying the things that we said 30 or 40 years ago. It's talking about Agent Orange as passionately and about Vietnamese MIAs as passionately as, as we ever did. So the wheel of history turns. Um, I wanted, Terry, do you want to say some last yeah, things? Yeah, before, else? Because we've gone yeah, over I, now. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll squeeze it in and then give it back to you, John. Uh, I'm sorry we can't ask uh, the other questions that came in, but we might be able to do that uh, uh, in, in another way online. I just wanted to ask one quick question that was asked to you, Tim, and that is, were Koreans who were living in Japan play any role in the anti-war movement against their involvement uh, in Vietnam? Quickly. I don't know about Vietnam, but I mean, lots, okay. of, lots of Koreans went to Korea, South Korea and yeah. participated in the democratic movement and many were arrested and further involvement. Okay, good, uh, thanks. But I'm well, sure Korean is, citizens did oppose Vietnam, just like a lot of, I mean, Koreans were citizens of Japan too. Yeah, good, so, thank you. I, I, I just wanted to honor that question. Well, Bobby and Rowan and Tim and Mark Pavlik, if uh, you're listening, I just wanna thank all of you for such illustrative and really important participation and presentations. We owe you a big thanks. Uh, we appreciate your time in preparing taking the time to do this, go back to sleep or go eat or whatever you do when this time is your time. And uh, and thanks to all of you in the audience for your involvement, participation and listening. And John, you, you, you've already let them know that it's recorded and available on YouTube. John, uh, I'm gonna thank you and say goodnight. It's your turn. Okay, well, Terry, I think it's been, I mean, I was we had a lesser turnout for this than many of our programs, but I think we actually learn more from this program yeah. than lots of, of the webinars. I appreciate uh, the educational role that Bobby and Rowan and Tim have played. And you know everybody who signed up, even if they didn't show up, will get a notice. You guys will get the notice and we'll, put it in the newsletter of, of when hopefully I'll get this up by tomorrow uh, and you'll get that information. And we always, I hope that this will grow uh, an even larger audience um, as, as the word spreads around about what people learned and, um, you know, maybe some lowly graduate student is going to, is now or later going to, look at this and decide that this is the topic of her or his PhD thesis, <laughs> that then we'll get a larger audience. So um, uh, let, let's also say this, John, if you don't mind. So depending on what happens here on November 5, and as I said, maybe you don't know about it, but we have an election coming up. And if it turns out as bad as it might be, we might see you guys much sooner than later, because we'll be looking for uh, safe places, believe me. Thank you. <laughs>